<laughs> what is like running an agency in, in the lockdown times? Is it sort of still emails and calls? Yeah, there is still stuff coming in. Yeah, so I mean, it's obviously got a lot quieter. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still the odd things coming through. But I think a lot of it is with people that are quite hopeful. Are hopeful. Mm -hmm. that is sort of that, gonna restart yeah like initially it was like we've got something we're still gonna go we're still gonna go in june or whatever it's like mm -hmm. yeah 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 the usual <laughs> <That's laughing>. yeah. <laughs> well yeah i have that interview yeah. later today <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. we'll see how <laughs> how those dates work awesome yeah. ellie first of all yeah introduction this is ellie cook this is the founder and the lead film and tv agent at uh echo artists her own her own agency where there's also um, a bunch of other people working, other agents looking after the commercial side of things. And they're sort of segregated a little bit by the type of jobs coming in. Correct me if I'm wrong in any of this, Ellie, but this yeah, is yeah, what I yeah. feel from as, as a client. Yeah, that that's makes how sense. I can <laughs> see. Yeah. Um, amazing yeah, team of, um, of girls and Nick um, uh, kind of <laughs> running day to day stuff. Day to day, because I, I haven't, we mainly do it over the phone or emails that's a typical correspondence with some of the agents at the agency like sophie and claire um i do pop in occasionally into the office maybe like once or twice a year to to hang and over the gifts and from the all the travels and i always see abundance of activity it's like such a busy place of what's yeah. going on at the agency can you talk us through us clients and i guess us those who kind of want to be represented one day what does an agent do what what does all this activity mean what's happening um yeah i think i think that the, one of the things i think when when you're on the other end of the phone as a client uh it's really hard to imagine what's going on behind the scenes because obviously i always think like if i was a client what what would i think or what would i want and you know you just don't get a phone call for a while or whatever <laughs> and then but what you don't realize is that like when it's it's just really busy all the time so like even if you think now there's not that many incoming projects coming in because people aren't shooting at the moment or they're thinking about it so there's stuff you know we're project tracking there's stuff coming up and obviously we're trying to keep our eye out and about what's happening but it, there's just there's always too much to do like and i think that comes from that comes from also caring about doing you know doing as much as you can there's never you could never do enough really i think and so everyone tries as hard as mm. they can to do how like, much how much would you say as an agent proportionally time-wise it takes to basically negotiating the jobs which came in and sort of became confirmed due to a good interview and how much of it is spent sort of looking for jobs for your clients or negotiating maybe to look at the reels or I meetings mean, i think we try to spend we want to spend like 50 percent of the time i think minimum if not more actually in terms of like outgoing projects so trying to um trying to find out what's out there trying to check in on stuff but i would say that stuff is things that haven't necessarily come in they're like mm -hmm. more more mm -hmm. like not sales calls but like stuff where you've heard you know someone's doing something good so you want to check in on it or or it might be something where you've done suggestions on something but then you want to follow up and see where they're at and there's always you could always do that a lot you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. without but then there's that fine line of not being too pushy and not being the person that's calling up and being really annoying because you're calling them up two days after you know it's like trying to read the situation figure out <laughs> like when's, me. when's the appropriate time no but i'm talking about producers like yeah, yeah, yeah. The time yeah. to like to follow up and i think um there's i would say really that's like 50 percent. and then it, it comes in flows you generally get it where there's there's always group shooting dates so and it, it, it changes every year, but you'll have something where loads of, um, I suppose the busiest time is when loads of people are coming to the end of a project. Loads of clients are finishing on a particular project. They're then obviously looking for their next project of which we've already been putting those, you know, we're putting people up. The minute they start a new job, we're still putting them up for stuff because we're always like a year ahead, really. Mm -hmm. Sometimes much shorter, like editors, it's always like the last minute, the last two weeks. Everything feels like last minute, but you're tracking those projects like, way ahead of time so um the minute someone's working on a job we're probably even before they've started that job already looking for jobs for them for like their next job after that but then what happens is you sow you're sowing those seeds that takes time scripts come in to then go out to those particular clients and they have meetings so you get these flurries of activities where you have meet uh, clients reading scripts doing meetings then we follow up on the meetings 
um, you have that combined with uh, people coming to the end of a project so then they're nervous about what's next so then they call up more because they're curious to know what's out there what's happening and then you also have all the contracts for some reason how annoying it is like you think you'd have a contract at the beginning of a job you don't start the job until it's signed right that's like logical normal practice does doesn't happen like that commercials is different but like it doesn't happen like that in film and TV at all. Um, why? Why is that delay? Uh, why? Why is something? I mean, I but I think it's because um, well, a lot of the time people you have a deal and you you agree the deal terms and stuff, but a lot of people don't want to go into the details about what those deal terms are. And for some people, they don't care. They're going to do the job. The client's going to do the job anyway. Some other people will be like, well, no, if they don't get that accommodation or that grade then they won't do the job so it just depends on the client and the producers but essentially you'll agree the deal but everyone's very they're quite rubbish at putting it in writing in, mm -hmm. a, in a form that everyone agrees um, before stuff happens because it's such it's always such a race and I think that's to do a cut to do with casting, finance, like the cast always comes on board last minute. So even though they could have been planning this for five years, it's always a flurry right towards um, the end. So you have this like just dash to get everything sorted. So I think the minute they go, right, we've got our client, we've got the DP, we've got the editor, we've got who we want. There's the rough terms. Yes, they've agreed to fee. Then they, then they just forget about it. So then we spend mm -hmm, ages mm -hmm. chasing all the time. We're like, can you just check? Can you follow up? Like, you know, with this person starting and getting paid as if, you know, they accept your, we believe that you're accepting our terms. Otherwise, you need to speak up and tell us. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always in the little details. Uh, you're like, wait, is this uh, down day paid? Or like, yeah, you exactly. sort of it's is, like, but you were not sure. Yeah, it's so always So much the... of that. Like, and to be honest, it's got a bit, I think it's got a bit better since mm -hmm. uh, Beck 2 and Pat did this, like, agreement for TV. Um and film and so the guidelines are a lot better well I, I still think actually what's really annoying is some of those terms are less advantageous to what we used to fight for so now mm -hmm. it's really hard to fight for that even more because it's black and white in this back to guide that people mm -hmm. do they're meant to adhere to but then like they also don't at the same time so um but i think that that's a lot it's made it a lot more streamlined in terms of what are people asking for but if you have a u.s production for example coming over here they sh it's a tv project they've got loads of money it should be going per the these backed uh, packed back to guidelines but they don't really know about it because they're like u.s team really mm -hmm, having to like pick mm -hmm. it up and so then it's then it just becomes a bit of a i mean you're just negotiating with all the same points anyway and so i don't know but it, basically i think because of all that stuff and because the flurry of getting people on board, they just want to get the crew. They want to get it crewed as quick as possible because they have to start prep the next day mm -hmm. and then start shooting like how many weeks later. And so then they just, and they're doing that across for everyone. So then they just drop the ball with the contracts. I think also with film, with film particularly, it used to be when finance would be closed. So, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to send out a contract until they've got all those signatures and all the So sort of waiting there. for last, last, last sort of, yeah, 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 it's all good kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Because yeah, out of experience, it usually yeah usually works out. There's been a couple points when it it was like odd where they I don't know the the currencies I mean, were takes, mixed up or something. Well, yeah, and the currencies are not. I mean, I think that there's there's stuff where it just takes it just takes forever. So generally, you'll get loads of people finishing on a project, get their con their contract signed at the end because that's when people have got time to do the paperwork. And then also a lot of the time in film and TV, they hold back a week of holiday pay. If you haven't got a limited company, you still get deducted holiday pay. Um, which is weird. You get it deducted, but you get it paid all at the end. And so a lot of the time they hold that back until that contract's signed. So it's like, there's, you know, you want to get it signed as quick as possible because otherwise then you've lost all leverage. But to be honest, at that point, the person's done the job anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah. Out, you know? move on, move on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. typical. So to a lot of interviews I go to or meetings, they always mention, oh, it's so awesome. You're with Ellie. You have this sort of um, kind of a, a great cardinal presence in the industry that everyone knows you in like very good terms obviously how did that happen how did you become an agent and leading to your own agency um i think because i mean i started off wanting to be a producer i think um and then i thought about so i was at uni doing film degree and then i thought about going to the nfts to do the producing thing that i did there and then i actually went and did work experience so i was like a production manager on a couple of shorts um 
for all the grad films. And then I just, just sort of test it out and see if I wanted to do it or not. And then um, I got called back by a production designer who was doing, uh, she was directing her own like, extracurricular short because her grad film was a documentary. So she was like, well, I can't actually show anything off. So then I actually produced that. And I mean, I blagged, I completely blagged that because and actually, that's quite funny because one of our DPs, Carlos Catalan, was yeah. a DP. <laughs> and I think I was 24. I think I was 23 or something. And I and I was I was just uh, I was somewhat terrified, but I think I just blagged it because actually it was just logical. You just work out what you need, and then you find a way to make it. It's <laughs> common sense producing, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then um, so then I did that, and then I thought I wanted to do that, but then. Um, I don't know. There was something. I had a bit of a change of heart, um, and then you know, I went, I went travelling for a bit, and then I actually did PGC. I thought I'd teach at one point, so I did tried that for a year. But then there was something when I did the PGC where I was like, actually, this is really similar. There's loads of stuff. The bit I liked about it was strategic because I was doing higher education, which is where mm -hmm. you're planning like the foundation year and stuff. And so then um, I realised that that's the bit that I sort of wanted to do, and then I just started applying for jobs um, at. Uh, different agencies really uh, as an assistant and I tempt basically I tempt a lot so I tempt for like uh, six months and and during that temp thing I worked at loads of agencies so I worked at Independent, United, Curtis Brown um, and then well United was PFD at that time so then I started and then I got a job at PFD and was like a floating assistant so I sort of went around all the different departments so I was in books in actors in HODs in literally you know I kind of experienced all the different parts of it which was really good to do because they all felt very different and I realized that obviously the HOD part was the bit that I wanted to do but I didn't really realize that until later on so then I got a job at Casarotto and I was an assistant in the comedy um, entertainment part which kind of the clients there would write for stuff like graham norton and have i got news mm -hmm. for you and they were very much like daily kind of quite like daily jobs like you'd literally count up the number of days you'd have to be across all the data much more like buyouts really similar actually to hd the process of it is very similar to hds and then there's the other side which was like dr drama um comedy drama writers and directors which was obviously like the normal writers director side mm -hmm. so then as i was doing that um i then uh, there, one of the agents at Casarotto Marsh, um, who did HODs, was going on maternity leave. And I just started to take on a couple of clients. I think I had two clients of my own for comedy. And then, um, but I always really wanted to do film. So I would go and, you know, that's what, I've, that's what I studied. That's what I learned. I'd go to London Film Festival and pay for all my own tickets off my own back because I wanted to do all that. I did an MA at the same time. So I basically did an MA in the morning before work and then I'd do my whole day of work and then um so then I was just really passionate about film basically and then so I approached them and said look I want to cover the maternity leave I don't care if that means I'm gonna potentially not have a job at the end of it because obviously it's temporary and who knows what happens afterwards but I just was willing to risk it really so then I did that and then I stayed on there for a bit and then I think um it was then when well basically then i sort of got approached by a u.s agency um to maybe go out there or to think about going out there and that's what made me start thinking about uh leaving really i hadn't really thought about leaving before then and then um but then whilst i was thinking about it i was like actually i don't really want to go to america like i'd like to have a family here at some point what would i do go out there and then come back there's no point i might as well just do that now and at the same time uh Lux had just started like literally I think they'd only just got their I think the website had only just gone up and I knew Jerry had come round to Casarotto Jerry was looking for a job because Fuji had shut so basically he had gone around all the agencies looking for a job everyone essentially said no there's no room unless you've got someone's going on turn to leave there's no room really and then Rebecca I knew um because we'd shared a client in the state or well, there was a client I think she was after that I repped when she was in the States. So I knew of her, I knew we had a very quite similar taste, I thought so anyway. And then, um, so then I just thought, well, what would I do? I'd either start up on my own or I'd join, I'd approach them to join them. So then that's what I did. So I approached them and then that so was- So Jeremy like, and yeah. Rebecca are part of Lux, right? They, they ones who- um, Yes, the they were all, they'd already, they'd already formed it. And I mm -hmm. think 
I think it had been going sort of behind the scenes for about six months, I think, when I joined. And at the time, they only had DPs, because I think Rebecca rep them, obviously Jerry and his background, and then Rebecca rep them from the States, a lot of them. And then they had like a couple of production designers and a couple of, they had one costume designer and like a couple of editors, I think. And then I left Casarotto to join there. And then a lot of clients came with me from there to Lux. And then I think then lots of other, then lots of other people started joining from all other agencies really. Um, and then it, so, so obviously I read loads of people at Casarotto already. And then I read loads more people at Lux that I, like that were new or that we'd taken on. And our client list at Lux was huge. By the time I left, there was like 170 clients. And um, there's lots of reasons why I left. But basically, I then left there to then set up Echo because I wanted to do it in a different way, really. Um, and that's how, I suppose, lots of people know... <laughs> No, who I am? The mother rep them. I'm one That's amazing. Another. That's an amazing you know, like, journey. I feel like there's lots from, of. I feel like there's lots of. Um, from yeah, I mean, from production of NFTs, of, yeah, to teaching yeah. To, to all sorts of agencies, and then ending at Lux, and then Echo exactly. Appears. And I think the thing is as well, it's like every agent role is is very different. Like you've got to know which which. Um, sort of section of the industry you want to represent and because i tried it all out quite early on i kind of got the feeling of what i what i believed in and what i thought i liked whereas i think what's i think is quite hard for people coming up through now if they want to be an agent or whatever is, is finding that niche of what they're interested in because they have such different paces and it's just such different vibes it's like um with writers and directors my experience was that you end up getting you end up working on loads of stuff that gets stuck in development for ages so my personality is obviously i want to get on get things going and moving quickly and the hod world completely works for that because it's so quick the pace is so quick you get people on a job the next week they're starting or the next day they're starting or whatever but you can get i, I like the fact that you can be involved in stuff that's happening and that's real whereas you're a lot of the time with writers you get stuck in that world of this is an amazing idea but like it's never going to get made. It never sees a light of day, and that's quite depressing. <laughs> Do you enjoy <laughs> watching the the films made by by the clients at the agency? It must what? be quite a nice feeling. Even yeah, now, so. just watching something, yeah, something that's yeah, been yeah. shot I mean, or edited I, by. Yeah, but I mean, I look at that for all. The thing is, is it's like all the people that I've repped in the past. It's like you basically feel like it's a massive family because it's like you've got all these people, all these relationships. You know, you spent. There are some people that I spent like ten years representing them you go through everything you i mean it's obviously a one a slightly one-sided relationship but i i take it all personally so i feel like you're going through that stuff with everyone mm. you know and then and then you either then not representing them for whatever reasons or not or they stay where they are or you know but it doesn't mean that you then go like oh i don't care anymore you know you, so actually when they make stuff, you still want to see what they're watch. You know what they're making because you've got an invested. You've invested in their life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a sort of godmother figure, someone a bag. I mean, it's a bit ridiculous, watching. but yeah. So, I mean, it's like you have a relationship with every, you know loads of people. So with everyone, you're yeah, shooting that's in That's why we face. care. You know. Yeah, there is that feeling of care. I think that's one of the biggest things I received as as a, and receive as a client is that sort of support being it like slightly like emotional support at times just like just letting it all out and be like okay i know that sometimes people probably... need a buffer though that's yeah that's it, it, it helps to also not you know not be direct to the to the production which i think one of the like neatest things of having an agent is that they can be that translator especially yeah. if, like someone like me is a bit more blunt like sometimes it just needs like i remember a couple of times i think it was clear that softening my emails like man like let's uh... <laughs> like, i know I think what you're you saying. sometimes i think it's hard because sometimes people you know this industry is essentially working with like you're working with people aren't you across the board and some people just do stuff or have a way that just can really wind people up right but that's you know, what i want to ask different. you yeah, I want to ask you about that because it's interesting as a, an observer, say, so even like Lux times, Lux was, became really big due to Instagram as well appearing. So people were sharing still. So it was like a very yeah, new yeah. way to represent and sell a DP to some extent. It was all based on stills. People almost stopped watching yeah. the actual pieces, especially in commercials world. Everything was based if you can pull three or five nice stills from a job and then like no one actually watches the job and checks how how good it was and it was yeah. suddenly like explosion of, of kind of new popular dps based on social media but i find 
going again through meetings, it's always referenced as people to people. So agency oftentimes is basically one lead agent and then all, like all the other agents are sort of their team. And I feel that say a techo or like you mentioned Lux, you know, it's just couple names and it's really not so much of an agency. It's actually agent is important. So for maybe those who are looking, you know, to be represented or going to meetings and interviews with different agents, what's your advice? How do you feel? Okay. That's maybe the agency or agent for me. How, what's, what's there to look for from, from say young DP side, for example? Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think that um, it depends how the agencies are structured because there are some agencies um, have their own client list. So for example, United, they have, uh, unless they've changed it, but they basically have their own list that they represent. I'm sure they do across, they work around different ways, you know, together, but they basically have their own list that they're responsible for. Whereas places like Caserotto and then Lux and Echo, we've all repped, um, you rep the, the same clients between however many agents there are, you all are looking after those clients as if they were your own list, but you're doing it as a team effort really and mm -hmm. i think i think it depends because i think it does shake down slightly differently because i think at lux it was getting to a point where people would have more of a point person because there were just too many clients so people would gravitate towards a particular person but we never really had that when i was at casarotto it was much more um the like agency you're all in it together mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and and that's what we have at echo as well it's like I mean, basically, people know, obviously, when you're going to, you have people like me or Rebecca or whatever, or Rosa at Casuato, but that's because they're, they're the film, they're the film agent that lots of people know. So it depends, that's who you get recommended by or all that stuff. But ultimately, that's just a name that everyone mm -hmm. else is doing the same job underneath. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, it depends where you go, really. Have so it depends on, on the agency actual? structure, basically, the way the agency is structured. Yeah. Yeah, and I think like how we do it, it's like obviously we've grown from because at the beginning we had to you didn't have any clients at all, you know, when we, when I first started up, or I had just the people that came with me. So it's like you, as you grow, obviously the we try and keep it so like there's a I don't know the stats on it and stuff, but like the agent client ratio where there's a certain number of clients to a certain number of agents to make sure that we're giving that service that basically I think we should do, which is why one of the reasons why I left Lux because. Um, you know, to do the job well, or how I think you should do it well, and that's my opinion, you know, that I think that um, you have to have time. And, and it's so busy, there's never enough time to do everything. So it's like the more clients you have, the more agents you need, and the more, but they also, all the agents have to be on the same, like, they have to have the same taste, really, to like, mm -hmm. or at least know what the taste is of the person that you're, work you're trying to get. You might not share the same thing, but you could know what you think is right for them or what's not, you know, based on where they want to go in their career and stuff. So I think as long as you've all got the same action plan for the clients across the board, then, then to be honest, the team thing is what I think works really well because it means that, you know, people go on holiday. What are you going to do if you go on holiday? Who's going to cover? Like, a, a, a client's job just doesn't stop, you know. It's generally when you go on holiday, suddenly there are loads of jobs for that person and decisions to make. So it's like you've got to be all on the same page, really, I think. But it just and then in terms of trust, you know they have to you have to you have yeah, to meet someone sense. and figure if you trust them I think really makes sense yeah and the taste I think is a very important bit yeah if you're sort yeah, of on the sure. same way for because also like probably that person will be getting a certain type of films as well they're not going to get like all types of films it's also going to yeah, be to yeah. some extent kind of what they like um I want to ask as well because uh, someone asked in the comments I think earlier it was whether to sign basically whether to sign with any agency if there is an offer even if it's sort of like unknown and maybe not that developed and so on or then to sign straight away with a with a rec recognizable agency is it better not to be signed than sign with like a relatively so so agency what's your i think view? it's really hard i think i think you know i'd love to think that I think it depends which agency you sign up with, but I'd love to think that like you start with someone on a journey and it takes stuff takes so long to get, you know, to where people want to get to and it doesn't happen overnight and it does just take a long time and it depends. You have to like ride certain waves. It's like, I feel like I've got 
or have had some clients that are like 50 and they've broken out at like 50 but that's just because they've had like an amazing film that suddenly then did really well you know it could be any any time but so I think that there are definitely some people do join like a cup. There's a couple of agencies where people join and then they generally move on from there afterwards. But um, you know, I think I think. But it is it then is it, it agency's hard. business model as well? Not business, maybe, but ethos is kind of hunt really young DPs, nurture them to say. 30 or something and then they usually move is it sort of like that's no what these agencies to, are designed no to do that no like mm. no agent will set out to be like i'm going to be the agent that takes on people because mm -hmm. you know it, you you get the reward as an agent it's really hard it's like hard slog you don't get much you don't get you don't mm -hmm. get a lot of thanks you're doing all this work it's really stressful you know you're having to read script you're having to do this stuff you've got a lot of clients going through various different things in their own lives that they sort of put on you you know which is part of the job but like it is stressful and so um i don't think people would ever really want to take on a client do all that work invest all that time and, and then, then they leave mm -hmm. like that's that's you know it's like it's like you spend an investment and you want it you want to see that person grow to where they want to go so you know mm -hmm. i don't think anyone would set out to do that but i think um i think in terms of i definitely think it's better to have an agent than no agent, I think. I think um, producers take advantage potentially of, not deliberately, but I think there are some people, if you don't have an agent, you that any agent will at least have some sort of comparable knowledge and experience about whether a deal, for example, mm -hmm. is, is what it should be or not. And obviously some agents will have a different different experience and will think differently or whatever. But I think that I generally have found when people haven't had an agent, they've they've not got the More best deal abuse rate wise yeah well just because it's like it's also really hard to do your own negotiation like it's so much easier for someone else to do it for oh you. yeah because then oh, you yeah. can be the creative and then someone else can do the other side and i think because they're quite different modes you know and i think do the you minute that you're do having you think to yourself do you think producers good? see through when when it's some um whatever's agent saying is actually dp saying and whatever's agent saying is agent actually saying. Do you think they can distinguish, okay, this is DP talking now, just using their agent? I think people come to their own conclusions and you can't control what that is. So mm. you have to try and figure out how, how, you know, obviously we try to be the buffer as much as possible so that ultimately then the client still gets work if it's something that's really tricky. But like sometimes, you know, it's people, isn't it? It's like they either, they, they come to their own conclusions basically, and they could be the wrong conclusion. But like, they might protect. think, yeah, it's, it's an annoying <laughs> agent when it's DP. <laughs> yeah. what's, the, what's the balance in the process of the rate negotiation? Basically, on one side, it's getting a fair deal. And then another side is also not being annoying, even as an agency, you know, having some sort of, there's some sort of reputation of not being, oh, that fucking annoying agent who always... Yeah. ask for this 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 and then it's it's then ultimately loses client work as well or it's client being annoying an agent has to be basically that what's the balance of striving what 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 is the thought process when you negotiate a deal i mean ultimately you're like the agent is meant to be the middle person between so it's like we have our clients but then we're also having to be diplomatic for the producers as well right because you want you want those producers to call back you don't want it to be really difficult. So the producers never call you back or they go, you know, there's so much betting that happens before. So a line producer or a producer could get a list of HODs and they'll immediately like cross people off potentially if they don't, you know, want to work with that person because they're really difficult. So that already goes on before you've even got an interview, before they've even been sent to a director to look at. So yeah, the, that is the very fine balance that everyone's striving to get all the time, really. And I think it's like, and I think some people do it better than others. I think, you know, it's like, um, if you know, I mean, I come from the place where I feel really, I really care about the clients and getting a fair rate. And if I know that like something isn't that fair, then, you know, I will definitely say that. And I'm quite firm and probably a little bit too firm about it because I will stand up for clients, you know, I'll fight for them basically, which I think a lot of other people don't do. But ultimately, then, then yes, the process is somewhat more challenging because you're not just saying, 
yes we'll do whatever you offer thank you we'll take we'll take that rate yeah perfect and we'll take that we're offering because half the time well actually most of the time all producers are coming in with left they're coming in with with a room to negotiate they very very ever rarely come in and go we're not we're not going to neg negotiate at all and the whole point is it's like it's a negotiation it's like you're both just doing your jobs it's like and there are some people you can do it with that are like it's so nice and it's funny it's like a pleasurable experience because you're both trying it on you're both being a bit cheap it's like a marrakesh both... souk market <laughs> sort of yeah, exactly. a game it's of like, negotiation you know, <laughs> yeah and and that's when it can be quite fun but then there are other people who just take offense to the fact you've even you've even asked for more or whatever and ultimately it also goes back to the client because it's like if you know and this is when the more you know the more you know your clients the better it is but like if you know your client well you know what they're going to take or not so you can already start that process before it's even begun you know because it's like you know from the get-go someone that negotiation process is starting the minute someone asks for someone to be sent a script because you know already if it's a tiny low budget and i know that certain clients won't work under a certain rate um, I'm talking about film and TV, but like, then, you know, then there's no point. There's no point. They're not going to. So then I would say that up front. I'd be like, well, they're not, you know, unless how much are not you gonna look. because you won't mm -hmm. be able to afford that person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless, unless I think it's something amazing. And then I know that, that person would do it no matter what, because actually it's a really good project, you know, which is then mm -hmm. goes back to that whole thing as also, the more, you know, your client, the more, you know, what a good project is for them. Um, which takes That's time true. to learn all of that and to go through that. It's stuff, true. You know? Yeah. Talk me through the, you mentioned sort of the, the DP's journeys, you know, you're kind of observing them for years and years afterwards as well, mm -hmm. even if they stop being your client. What is the average, okay, it's, it's tricky, of course, average DP's journey. So they, they say mm -hmm. they signed with you 1st of January. What then happens for those next years? What's the typical route? I don't think there's an average journey. That's really hard to answer that because I think, it totally depends on the person's work. Half of it's luck about being in right place, right time. The other half's like drive and how they've got there. And I mean, I think, and it depends also, we're talking about whether it's commercials, whether it's film or TV, because really I think the ideal is that people work across both equally because really a lot of, it's changing to be honest, but like a lot of people would make money in commercials and then they would then pick their passion projects in film or TV where generally the rates are lower. But actually at the moment, the way TV's going, some of those rates are going back up again and they've mm -hmm. got, also got really good content. So, you know, it's all sort of changing. And I mean, it was changing just before Corona. So um, I think that there is, it's really hard to say what an average trajectory is. I think some people can start and have an agent and then they don't really get anywhere beyond where they started. But I think the mm -hmm. whole point is trying, trying to others get one film and suddenly they're like Matt, you know, person of the moment. So I think it just depends on um, choosing well and well being as, you know, trying to pick something that you would be proud of, that you would want to watch yourself um, and that you care about and also checking in terms of the other HODs like the best films have been where they've been a collaboration you can tell all the HODs are good everyone's come together you know and I think that the, the problem is with someone starting out is that you can't get those opportunities because they want someone who's done 25 films that are all Oscar and BAFTA winning to shoot their you know 500 pound a week paid <laughs> project or whatever so it's like you know, that balance is really tricky. So I think the main thing is, is that every time you're looking at something or sent a project, you're working out, you're looking at what the, um, you know, what you're, what you're getting out of it. Is it like a relationship? Are you building a relationship with that producer or that director? Or is it someone else's work you admire? Or does that producer actually, that project might not be amazing, but the other projects they do generally are really good? Or, um, you know, is the script itself incredible and you don't know anything about anyone else, but you're willing to take a punt because the script's really good? Mm -hmm. Um you know, so this to some extent as well, well luck as well because you know sometimes it does come together nicely sometimes it doesn't really obviously if you know the age of these right how the film ends up it's so many hands yeah. and uh, kind of on, on the way they can make it great or, or or not they can actually destroy it as well i guess but it's I mean, it's I think it is a bit of luck. I do think it's a bit of luck, but I also think it's um, being being available, actually, 
being available at a time to jump on an opportunity when it's there. So, mm -hmm. and obviously that opportunity might not be there for ages, but then if it is, being able to do that. And I think the one thing I could say as well is actually interesting because I was, I just, we were just listening to the NFTS talk with Ula and Stuart and Ben, and I used to rep Ula and Ben as well. <laughs> and so like, but they, one thing Ula mentioned was um, about having, being freelancer and having like spare money essentially to be able to fall back on. And mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't say, I couldn't, that's such a good point that she made because it's like you've got to be available financially to be able to jump on those opportunities. And generally the amazing opportunities will be ones that don't pay anything. They could be a freebie. They could be because you want to get in with that person. And then, you know, you, it depends. I'm not saying everyone should do loads of freebie stuff all the time because sometimes it goes nowhere and there's no point, but picking the right, picking those right things because they're essentially an investment for your future. And um, like, one of the probably the best example which to be honest i think is a bit of a one-off is that you, the lady macbeth film um because that was an eye feature and uh, i read the script and i was like this is better that script was better than loads of the scripts i had that were like 20 million 30 million whatever and it the i feature i think i don't know what the final budget was it was meant to only be 350 i think it might be 500k at the end all HODs were getting, um, it was favoured nations, which means everyone was in the same boat. They all got, I think, a grand a week from my memory, but they uh, were doing six day weeks. So actually it was less, normally the I feature scheme is a bit less than that, but because they were doing six day weeks, they had that bit extra. And um, basically like, it was such a good script that I would then, I sent that out to, at the time, to all the clients that were, um, wouldn't normally have worked for that low basically so we ended up getting i mean we went through quite a few different people but like at the time we ended up getting ari shot it jacqueline was the production sign although she was at a different agency and then uh nick emerson was the editor who else and then yeah holly but i didn't rep holly so but i mean at the time they wouldn't have necessarily taken those jobs and like and that was a lot of i i i dealt with on that project i spoke with the producers a lot we talked a lot about lots of different people kept following up you know load so i think that's that's one of those ones that really that totally so a good careers. script rules a, a good script mean you can get pretty good people even if the money is not there right i think it depends and i think that's where i feel like i had i'm, I'm like bigging myself up but like i thought on that because i was really passionate about it i would then talk to the clients as well and try and persuade them to do it too because i think a lot of the other time if you just sent a script off if, you, if i hadn't read it and other people didn't read it you'd be like well i don't know the director he'd done th obviously he'd done loads of theater stuff but it's like i haven't seen his theater stuff so i don't know it's the first time you know it's the first timer that no no one knows it's totally on unknown so then you can only go by the script um mm -hmm. but then obviously some people don't even read their scripts when stuff gets sent through they'll just pass because of the money but that's when i was like i think you should look at it because it doesn't matter about the money you should, it's worth doing but then you know people still pass because they can't afford to do it or whatever so but I think that that's when it's important. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's really important to read scripts because that would have just been any other eye feature that you might not have read, you know, and just passed on it for loads of clients. But actually having read it, it that became the passion project. And I mean, that comes back to the size of the agency, right? Having a certain cap yeah. just to have the time to read um, scripts. Yeah. Because I can't imagine you can read scripts when you have 200 clients. It's just physically it's not way you, you can't. I mean, you can't. And it's so it's so hard to do that and even if you read i mean you can read like 10 pages and see and get a flavor of it for sure you can get a sense of tone in like the first 10 pages but you know yeah you need to read you need to read scripts i think to be mm. able to do the job properly i remember reading the for the second unit of chernobyl script that's like uh, yeah, blows no, your I, mind when you know on the paper <laughs> on the paper you're like this is gonna be so big <laughs> like this is such a well-written series yeah. I vividly remember. But also, interestingly, <laughs> I guess that is it typical or is it speeding up now that the time given to read something of that size, obviously, you know, there's a lot of episodes and so episodes. on. Yeah, yeah, and you're like, interviews in when? In two days? It's like, yeah. <laughs> let you sit down and read, read, read. It's like 500 pages. Um, so that's, is it normal to, to have quite yeah. little for Unfortunately, this, right? like, I think that, I think... Well, it's just the pace again. It's everyone wants to move really quickly. It's like they've only just got that version of that script locked off. You know, they want to get it out. They need to get meeting. Everyone's keen to get going. You know, I think that um, sometimes people have stuff way in advance and they can send it over. But 
And I think you wouldn't normally have to read like seven episodes, like, or how many episodes, you know what I mean? You wouldn't yeah. have to read all of the episodes before having a meeting normally, but you'd read one or two and then have a meeting and then... Get the flavour, yeah. But I mean, you're, you're, that was a quick turnaround, but generally they do have a thing where they're like, right, we get the script out today, would he be able to start meeting from tomorrow or the next day? But really, by that, pro by that time, actually everything gets set up. It's another week already. Or it's like a week and a half away until people actually meet because they're coordinating with lots of different people from different agencies as well. Mm -hmm. um, Makes sense. But it is always a quick turnaround, I think. That does happen a lot. But that's why you've got to be ready to like jump, which is just annoying because not everyone can do that. But people don't want to wait. And so sometimes they'll send scripts out. And if you haven't jumped quickly enough, you haven't read it, like in a week, they might have hired someone mm -hmm. by the time mm -hmm. you've even mm -hmm. got around to reading it. So, mm -hmm. you know. Good. I want to ask on uh, on behalf of those who haven't like shot say uh, a debut feature, um, meaning meaning the the fiction, would you say for those people shoot any feature, just shoot the feature just so you have it on your CV, or do you still have to sort of choose what what's your first where you're dipping your toe? Ultimately, first? you've got. Yeah, I think you have to you have to be able to whatever you're shooting, it's only worth it if you can use it to help sell your work after. So if you're shooting something because it's because it's a feature, but it's like the worst thing in the world and you'll never really want to show that as a light of day because it's completely against all the taste of the stuff that you would actually do, because I think you've got to put out what you want to get back, then um then there's no point doing it. But yes, if you haven't shot it, then everyone goes, oh, but he hasn't shot a feature before. They haven't done that, you know. But then I think they'd, they'd be more willing to go along with it if they really believed that you were the right person visually because of, like, the other stuff that you've done as a short or something else. But that, based unfortunately, on other the low-budget mm -hmm. schemes that should... Yeah, basically. But I think the, the low-budget schemes, which should be the place where these, um, you know, where you can get your first feature... Unfortunately, they're so competitive because it's the director or writer's first feature, sometimes the producers, and then the schemes try and buffer it with people that are really experienced. So then you end up getting people who have done like five films shooting a first time feature. But to be honest, they mm -hmm. don't really want to do that. Everyone wants to be moving upwards, you know. So mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. that constant dynamic, that constant debate we're having all the time. But I think mm -hmm. it really you've got to feel you've got to feel proud and be selective of the work that you put out. So you could shoot a feature and then just be like, I have shot something, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. But <laughs> I'm going to show you. They, they can come and it's buy great, you. It's they great, it's great. They'll find it on IMDb. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that people only have to see something that they don't like that puts them off. So if they see that you've done that film that's like a really, uh, I don't know, a really brash... Three point, three point two on, level rotten tomatoes. So, <laughs> yeah exactly if they see that and then they want they want their film to be this like you know cans critic hits then they they won't shoot they won't get you for that even though everything else you've shown because they they won't they don't have to trust so to be honest people are more willing to trust someone who hasn't got anything than they are to trust someone mm -hmm. who's got something that they don't like yes. mm -hmm. which so it's Makes really sense. it's really hard i think that first feature Makes sense. Um, let's talk a little bit about getting signed. There's a bunch of questions coming in, and I can see some in that uh, question box as well. Uh, I've pre-read. So I guess the main question is, what is the stage at which it's worth approaching an agent? And should you be approaching agent, or should you be waiting basically for agents in interest to actually be signed? No, I think if you're... Uh... I would say that if you're starting out, you should always be approaching the agents. I don't think a lot of agencies wouldn't approach someone who hasn't got an agent already. Um, they'd maybe go to like the NFTS grad show or try and look at stuff and try and see where people are coming up from. So that might be a time where an agency might approach you. But generally, if you haven't, if you're starting out, I think you'd be you could be waiting for a long time if you didn't start approaching people. You've got to get your name out there, I think, and also visually, like website, in like social media, all of that stuff is so important um, that you have to be proactive. Because also, if you're waiting for an agent to call you, then I, it's a relationship, right? So it's like then that would make me think as an agent. Well, then how are you gonna? You've got to go into a meeting. You've got to get that meeting. You've got to go in. Mm -hmm getting mm -hmm. it you know like it, they're really competitive when you go into a meeting and you and you've sat there you haven't done any mood boards you don't look like you care about a project 
then if you don't really care about getting an agent because you're waiting for them to come to you, then that might translate into when you go and meet for a project and therefore then you won't get a project. So then, mm -hmm, then that mm -hmm. would look bad on us as well as doesn't help you get anywhere. So um, I would definitely say to be proactive as much as you can. So basically send your reels and all of that, submit to festivals, because you do go to festivals, right? We've, 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 we've yeah, seen each other, yeah. well, at Camera Marge, right? It was as well in Cannes, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well we, go to, we generally go to Cannes, Camera Marge, and um, London Film Festival, really, are the main ones we go to. How does the social media change the game? Because obviously this is very new for everyone, to some extent, right? It's only been going for properly yeah. for like two, three years. What's the, what, what is your view on that? Because I think you're much more kind of, classic agent to an extent because you deal mainly with long form <laughs> yeah. so i think that, i think instagram is more of a commercial dp's definitely think kind of works, game yeah. because it's it's very very quick turnaround uh yeah. where i think you see you see through that pretty quickly i think so i'm intrigued to know your opinion i think, on, I think the that. thing is i think it's really good i think you have to do it i think it is really important to do we try and encourage loads of clients to do it because i think I th the thing is, I think there's different generations. Like, you know, a lot of film, a lot of classic films that are getting made, that they're the ones the studios or the ones that get made a lot by people that have been in the industry for years, they won't be looking on Instagram. They won't be looking on Facebook. They won't be looking anywhere, really. They'll just be looking at classic, you know, reels and or like websites, even the fact that, you know, we've got websites for clients. It's like they would look at that stuff now. But then there's a whole mm -hmm. other generation who who uses Instagram like daily life. So then they will be looking they will be looking at it. So it just depends. But I think you have to think as a client or potential client, you know, you've got to think that like a producer or a director of someone you really want to work with is gonna come and look at your profile. Because I think that's what will happen a lot more now. But I still think there's a whole load of producers that don't because they just don't use it. It's just not their it's just not their life, you know. Whereas mm -hmm. I, it just mm -hmm. it's where the generations are split, I think, in terms of who's making stuff. And Hence, I guess, things. commercial, right? Because it's a pretty kind of a yeah. typical young kind of producer, yeah, production exactly. manager in their late twenties, uh, early thirties, sort of exactly. sitting on the ground, <laughs> liking the pictures. No, but it's interesting. I find that amazing. I find it's like a very, very different approach to 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 how people are found and and what's valued and what's not valued. What's kind of the white noise by now because obviously yeah, there's yeah. this whole trend with social media the stuff starts to look similar because yeah. everyone starts to sort of copy and that's where the trends in commercials come in is it dark is it meant to be colorfully backlit and so on so dps yeah. are sort of slightly kind of slightly deer in the headlights whether you meant to like adjust and start shooting that to be hired for commercials or do you kind of follow your line and then don't really change the style where I think in film TV, it's a bit more kind of the, the movements are much slower in, in what's kind of yeah. considered cool or now how you're meant to shoot. Do you feel that when you get requests for, say, specific clients, when we say clients, sorry, for those listening, might be just a bit confusing. Oh, yeah, the yeah. clients is the DPs, production designers, makeup artists, editors. It's the client, Ellie's clients, basically. I yeah. am Ellie's client, basically. So <laughs> when production calls in for a specific client, do you see there are trends like okay this year this person is very popular everyone wants yeah, all them all the time all the time and actually it depends so if you've won like an oscar there will always be stuff that comes in for like that person pretty much but like then you can also see like the type of sometimes if that if that person would say had won an oscar like 20 years ago then you know the type of person calling in for them now mm, is of mm -hmm, a certain generation mm -hmm. Generally, mm -hmm. in terms of the projects, they were making. at that party twenty yeah, years ago. Yeah, exactly. And then I think, I mean, it's not always. Of course, it's not always. <laughs> like that. And then I think, um, but you do, and it's all based on the last film. So if there's a film that's a hit uh, at a festival or whatever, it's just a hit, you know, critically, baffled, whatever. Then um, yeah, all the calls come in for the people that are involved in that. So you get, you totally get associated. It's really depressing mm -hmm. because obviously mm -hmm. it should be about the quality of the work that someone's done. So the film might not be very good, but the work that they've done in it could be amazing because they've like created this whole thing on no money and all that stuff. People, they don't actually care. I think they, I think mm -hmm. they obviously do once you meet and they, you've got to have the skill base to do that in the first place. But really, 
people's time is too tight that they just want to they just want flavor of the month and flavor of the month is who's associated with the film <laughs> flavor of the month, of the month. <laughs> basically <laughs> i feel it's like totally me true. now ellie <laughs> amazing flavor. that's how people call each other flavor of but the i think you told me flavor. that you, know you, I mean, there's... you told me that yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah of course yeah 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 and it's also that's like a lot of dps amongst our our colleagues and friends discussing that obviously that you almost to some extent you also you want and you don't want to be that flavor of the month because you know that flavor is going to get kind of repeated over and over and over and then you basically chucked yeah. out of the commercials world because you fucking that's it they shot all of this kind of similar looking stuff and now it's on the yeah. next girl or guy it's it's the typical story that the Sometimes commercial dp design get... waves Sometimes you don't get um, chucked out, though. Like, there, there are some people where... That's true. Or you move to features, that, I guess. You move to yeah, features. Yeah, I think the that's people the... a lot of people, like, um, are inspired by or follow are people whose work has a consistent, um, you know, has a consistent theme to it. So, like, for example, if you think about... One person I'd say would be, like, um, Rob Hardy, for example, right? Mm -hmm, like, he mm -hmm, has a consistent mm -hmm. look and has tried to create that from the you know from from all his projects so when you were saying in terms of um people oh, Robbie changing, Ryan is probably like, also yeah that exactly gap. exactly mm -hmm. and so it's, when you say people are morphing to like just fit the brief but that's proper there, established there element, that's proper yeah, exactly. established so I think like, you can yeah. do that when people mm -hmm. when you have established that already mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you're new and coming out and then you do have to be adaptable because that's what people want you know until you then have that grounding until you can establish yourself as being what well, I'm the person that, you know, I want to do certain sort of things like this, or I will always do it like this, or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. that is that's unique. Totally um, makes sense. Yeah. I want to ask as well regards the, you mentioned sort of not just longevity we're talking about now, but also that getting there, right? That is it true that younger gen of DPs kind of want it quick? They're sort of, okay, I'm signed yes. and I want success in <laughs> half a year. Is it? Do you see it's a generational thing that slightly all the DBs understand it's a grind and it takes project after project after project to get I to think, Oscars? Um, I think it's also just personality, it doesn't it? It depends on patience and stuff like that. I think definitely generation is like a generational thing for sure. People do want it so much quicker. It's like you can see that people, for example, even just moving agencies, you can see that people move agencies. Like if mm. someone gives someone like two years mm -hmm. or something, but they're at the beginning of their career in a certain field, it's like, that's not long enough. You know, it takes, it takes ages because you could be putting, you could be putting someone's name up for stuff for like, well, I mean, two years as an example. And I could keep, every time that producer has a project, that, pro that same one producer, for example, might have like, one project a year, if it's film, maybe less, maybe more. And you could keep being like, look, you know, this person I talked to you about last time, I really would like you to meet them, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. That takes time. So if they've only made like one project a year, it's going to take a lot longer because there's also 30 other people meeting for that same project, of which three of them they've worked with before. So they've already got a relationship with. So it's just competitive. So it does That's take. So it true. does. You've got yeah. to chip away at it. And it does take a long time. Um, and I think people are patient with it i think it, i don't think i think some people are some people aren't really it just depends on how long they've mm -hmm. been if they've been in and it like for you a long mentioned time, I think they get yeah. the process you know no totally well we're gonna restart because it's almost been an hour and it's gonna just cut us suddenly and i think we're gonna move into the people's q a hi yeah uh... hello hi <clears throat> great what a great chat. I think, yeah, it was really interesting to both as a client to hear of the inner <laughs> workings and to understand how an agent thinks as well. I wonder what's uh, before. So first of all, let me clarify, guys. So if you ask the question, can you please ask it again? Because when we reset the, the questions go, I can see they're starting to come back in. But if you, meanwhile, just type them in into that question mark box below and I'll, I'll pull them from there. Hey, Sophia. I, can I really want to read them all. It's really hard not to be like. <laughs> um, I want to ask, as an as a client, what can one do, including myself, to make your life easier as an agent? Oh, a magic question. <laughs> be honest, uh, Ellie. I'm, I'm I'm ready. Stop. I think. I mean, the thing is, I think one one thing that's I totally get, like for a client. 
I always think like if I was a client, how would I feel? What would I do? And it's like, I'll be a nightmare client. <laughs> I'd be like, I want to know what projects I've been put up for. I want to know when. I want a regular call, like every, re like really regularly. I would, because I'd be sat at home just being like, what's happening? What's, you know, it's my livelihood in your hands. But I think on the other side of that, there's an element of trust. So, and there has to be for it to work. So I think that some clients really want to, like some clients, I think, get a bit, itchy they want to know what they've been put up for they want to know what's out there and obviously when they're not working that becomes they like up that mm -hmm. a little bit because mm -hmm. they're obviously nervous about it which i totally get and it's totally justified and they should absolutely be able to do that the only thing that's tricky on the other side of it is that when it's really really busy you end up spending your time filling the clients in what, what yeah. projects are out there rather than actually being able to put them up for the project or follow up on the project that you've already put them up for because it's like if you have loads of clients doing that at the same time and obviously it takes time so it's that balance of trying to make sure that the clients yeah. feel really short because ultimately every day I keep saying ultimately but every day you're thinking about all the client base like all the time so it's like you know a client at home might be like doing something else. I might have been holiday with their kids, but like every day you're like, oh, is that coming for Edgar? Oh no, that's coming for that person. Oh no, like, and obviously we're all in the same office and we're all talking about it. So, you know, you're literally thinking about each client all the time, but which people don't see because mm -hmm. they obviously don't see the inner traffic. So they only see when it gets a result, when it's like, mm -hmm. here's a script or you're going to someone's asked mix. about you, yeah. you know, and actually for every one of those, you know, there's like a hundred other projects you've been put up for or more or whatever that that you we're chipping away at behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I it helps. To at have a bit the of beginning, patience, I, um, I was getting these little PDFs. Well, not little. They're like four pages long of all the projects I've been kind of put up for. Yeah. And it, it was a nice yeah to have it, but then I think they stopped and we had a chat, and that was the reason. Uh, you were saying, well, it takes time to put these for each client, and I yeah, think exactly. it's such a it's fair. Like such a fair comment but even seeing them for for a couple of times once or twice it's like okay so there is that yeah. what's going on behind the scenes and then think... i'm absolutely fine and i'm sure all the clients are like not getting them just knowing it's happening it was yeah it was like oh wow i didn't know there's so many projects like yeah, that, that yeah. discussion you just I see like you say it. yeah we just see the result and think oh yeah that's this one project you're like yeah well yeah fucking hell it took like yeah exactly it's not like you went to the other project, the project. Yeah. <laughs> well i think it's I, I think the thing is is i do think those lists are helpful for that reason but generally what we'll try and do and what we've been trying to do a bit more of now is like calling up everyone and telling them over the phone because it's just quicker to do that mm -hmm. but then at the same time you're not going to reel off like a thousand projects of which one. <laughs> yeah. because Down like the just... five minute list <laughs> yeah and it doesn't mean i mean sometimes those lists i think are good because i think people can read them and then see like oh there's that producer and i know that producer and mm -hmm. you know but then then in theory we should know all of that already so like we're already acting on that you know if you've rep someone for ages and you already know mm -hmm. that a lot of the time mm -hmm. but i don't know i think there's there's pros and cons to those but generally we'll try and do it over the phone i think i think people have a right to know what they've been put up for for sure and we have all like, we have the lists of that all the time it's just sometimes they're not that meaningful because all the projects that we're putting up for like initially where your name has specifically gone out doesn't necessarily mean there's not a whole lot of other projects that we're tracking where they haven't they're not mm -hmm. ready for a dp yet or they're not ready for a costume designer so it's like you've already you're on production designers and then they want dps and sometimes you try and like shoehorn in a different department to try and get there early and stuff but like it was nice know. yeah but it was like obviously for me it's nice to see that list but it's because uh, for example i learned of some directors i was like oh there's this kind of youngish director i've never even heard yeah. they shot like two features already but then yeah like i think time your time as an agent is so much more important for my career as a client i would rather exactly. like, you spend it it's on like that rather than me like on instagram looking at that director's work which is yeah, nice exactly. but then in a grand scheme of things you spending an hour more on negotiating and trying to push for me getting it is much better than me just yeah. like hopefully maybe trying to get a coffee with that director and then i'm sure like 40 other exactly. dps doing the same it's like we all know how it works we know how it's a it's a busy industry um great let's take a look at them uh ah, i wanted to ask you sorry it was it kind of came in the questions as well regards the size of of, of echo and what it is now i remember we we're chatting ages ago about how great that there is a certain you know cap per 
agent what are your plans like what's how what do you see in terms of the size you're trying to keep it kind of boutique um yeah i think um i mean i don't ever want to i don't ever it's again that like agent client ratio so it's like you only take on if you're going to take on more clients then we need more agents to be able to to be able to service that and i think that the team that we've already got now um i think that works you know with georgie and claire and sophie obviously in commercial i think that i think that all works really well um mm -hmm. in terms of covering it and like i said it's that agent that agent um ratio like uh statistic but agent client ratio but i think that um so yes yeah, so like to be honest now the people that would if we want to take people on there really would be people that are I think at the moment would be like established or people I've read before because I already know them and have invested that time. Mm -hmm. um, time. Yeah. Or, or it would be someone like you're always going to take on a few new people coming out that will always be there because we always want to have, you don't just want to have one list where everyone suddenly gets better. There's always that growth going through. People mm -hmm. are always moving mm -hmm. up and that's mm -hmm. the plan, right? You always want people to move up through the ranks as it were. And so, but I think that the, the new people would have to have something that's like really unique and original. And also because initially it's like really hard to sell, to be able to sell someone if they haven't got anything. So you've, Once. Mm -hmm. Battery's low. I'm just gonna plug it in. Basically, oh. you've got to have faith in what uh, in the client, and that they, um, you know, that you trust that they're gonna be able to deliver. Because if you present someone to a producer, that has an impact on Echo and you know our mm -hmm. um, reputation as well. So, but generally, sometimes if there's someone that's got some some work that we think is really original or really good and they haven't done much but then we meet them because we meet everyone before we take them on and they were just really nice and really personable then that has a massive impact because it's like you know people want to work with people that they like ultimately it's like a really small industry they only hire people back that they like working with and if someone's being really tricky or really difficult or they don't like working with them then they won't hire them again because there's 20 other people or more that would that they do like that they've worked with you know Makes sense. Uh, I'm going to show this comment. I don't know if you see the question. Uh, from... Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, so that's from Ludo. It's a great sound recorder. It's actually went to North Korea with me and a bunch of other dogs. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So he's asking, are you thinking of taking on new skills on your HOD roster or, uh, for example, sound AD production? Um, I have thought about this a lot before. I am really interested in in the sound route just because i think it's part of it's like another craft i think um which mirror which fits with everything else but at the same time i don't want to run before we can walk and i've just had a baby and it's like this you know <laughs> this it's uh, having the right time now there's obviously corona as well it's like having the right time for that to make sense um I, I i don't really want to go down the road of like ad's and I think it just weakens it weakens what we're sort of about really and it's much they're much more like logistical um mm -hmm. and there's you know, separate agencies dealing with that right there's sort of a production style agencies where they do ad's for example yeah AD. there's loads that do that, that do loads of that stuff and the thing is it's like as an agent you're also working out like you have to you know or as a business owner it's like you've got to run a business you've got to be able to work out what's profitable and actually it's profitable to do ad's and production and that stuff because actually you know, like a line producer or a producer. And I've thought about line producers before, but like they are, they they make a lot more money. They make more money than CPs sometimes. So that makes sense to do that. But then at the same time, they're also the person that you're negotiating with all the time. So it's like a slight slight clash of interest, there. slight conflict of interest where it can work for you, it can also work against you. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know. I like kind of what we have. I'd rather represent like writers and directors than I think more production people really. Makes so that it's still create it's still on the creative basis. So Voyner.co asks, I live in another country than the agency, but I want to get signed. Is it enough to send emails? So geographical location question, which is interesting. Should people even be approaching an agent if they're not in the same country? Yeah, I think that's totally fine because I think lots of people have different a different agents for different territories so a lot of people have like a u.s agent and a uk agent or a european agent depends where you live so 
we represent quite a lot of people that live in Scandinavia and they've got a Scandinavian agent as well as us, as well as a US agent. Um, the more agents you have, it gets a bit complicated just because there's, you know, a lot of people to communicate with, but um, it depends where you're at, really. Um, but I think you can. I think it just depends on where you want to work. If you want to work in the UK, then you'd probably, depending on your level, you'd have to probably present yourself as being local to the UK because... If you haven't, if you're not like a superstar DP that work will come in for anyway, then actually people won't want to put you up when they could hire someone else who they've worked with before who's in London who they could put up. It depends on your relationship and if they, you know, you're less likely to get work if you can't put yourself up as a local, I think, if you're starting out. Um, so I think that's important. But I also don't know what, you know, Brexit and obviously the travel restrictions at the moment with obviously corona will change things i don't know mm -hmm. how long lasting mm -hmm. that will be and everything so but in theory yes you can have a agent in different countries where you live great um this is kind of a general question which often comes up how much body of work you're looking for in a young dp just starting out I'm, i guess they mean the dp you would maybe sign what has to be on yeah. that reel i don't think there's anything specific i think it just has to show the stuff that they're trying to get or where they see themselves and it has to show a sense of taste and it has to be the same taste that i'm interested in to them mm -hmm. you know or well, something that something that appeals to us when we're going through the people that you know obviously we get asked a lot for representation so when we're going through there has to be something that speaks to us as a company where we're like okay we really like this person's work and why even if they haven't got that much the way that they've presented it might just look like actually that's the kind of thing that we're into and want to meet them or something would you um, say that that the dp has to have a some form of commercials on their reel when approaching agent i mean we like to have people that can do can do both um but we have other clients like not necessarily dps we have other clients that haven't had any commercials and then um sophie doesn't our sophie our commercial agent does an amazing job at getting at getting them when they've had nothing which is pretty an impossible task uh but i mean it that that has generally been because they've been like really friendly and easy to get on with it's the right place right time as well because like i don't know it was a really busy period they're available they jumped to that opportunity to do it as well and that first job they did may not have been amazing but then they've then developed a relationship and then they've done better commercial since so ideally people have a, an example of both because it's really hard to get someone a commercial if they haven't got any commercials that you can show and it has to be a good commercial too or something that they want to show um particularly with the commercial industry because it's very fickle they want to see what you've they want to see what what they want to make they want to see you've done already before basically mm -hmm, exactly that yeah a car com car car commercial yeah, with the cars. red car Food, liquid, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh my god, the liquid. Um, uh, another one from Ludo, actually. Well, we have to ask a little COVID question. What's uh, Ellie's thoughts on the future of industry post COVID, mid and long term? Um, who knows? I mean, yeah. I <laughs> let's say I let's thought... say 2020. Do you think the commercials will come back 2020? Yeah, I basically think that there's that from now there'll be like the odd thing trying. There's people now already trying to adapt the projects they already had to work around social distancing guidelines. And like, you know, we were talking before, but there's loads of guidelines coming about how to be able to do that. I think it's going to be really hard. I don't think it will be anywhere like normal. And I think there'll only be a few things able to get made because I think it will cost those more money for producers to do it. Some of it's just practically impossible um you know we were saying earlier it's like hair and makeup and costume designers it's like they're gonna you know to do their job properly then they need full ppe kit there's not enough of that for the mm. nhs let, let alone crew um i think that in terms of there being jobs i think there is going to be a few there will be a few things coming up i think september might be a bit busier um it all depends on individual countries release like being able to travel our own country like social distancing really i sort of don't think it will really get back to normal until social distancing is finished um and until travel until there aren't any travel restrictions which i think could be maybe march next year i don't know i think that there'll be stuff before then um and my worry with it is that 
I think there's pros and cons to it. I think there's going to be more because everyone's lived now been in this age of zoom and where everyone can do everything remotely and everyone's working from uh, from home i feel like costume designers and hair and makeup artists are going to have a bit of a hard time i think because i feel like they'll be cut out of um a lot of shoots already in commercials lots of people don't want a costume designer to come out and shoot with them if it's away they want them to design it pack it all off and then they'll get a local mm -hmm. person to oversee it in the in spain or wh whichever country they're in Whereas I think now they'll try and do stuff where they can advise via Zoom as they get out to having to get that person out there. But it's just not the same. I mean, ha hair and makeup, how are you going to fit a wig? You know, you need to... Um, so I feel like they're... In some, ways it mean, <laughs> in some ways it'll mean that some people, there'll be more opportunities because there'll be stuff that you can do in a different country that you couldn't do before. But, but to do the job well and how people would do it normally, I think that people will try and cut corners a little bit to try and get it a bit cheaper and not have mm -hmm. someone go out to that country to do it or location or whatever so i don't know i feel like overall i think the industry will bounce back it's just a matter of when that happens you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's quite an interesting question from i guess people wanting to maybe sign but they don't they live in uk but not london um what's your answer to them is living in london essential I don't think it is. I think, again, it's that, are you willing to work in London as a local? And it depends. Like, it depends on where you're at, what your bottom line is in terms of earnings. It, you get the most opportunities for stuff if you can. Essentially, the more willing you are and more able you are to do things, the more jobs you're going to get or more opportunities you're going to be able to get. So, But so much stuff shoots in Wales. Like, so many people need a, someone living locally in Wales. Uh, so much stuff shoots in, like, Liverpool and Manchester. So you have, like, to be honest, lots of people that then live in London then have to go and do a job in Manchester or Wales. But then they generally, if they're hired from London, they'll then get put up and productions will pay for people, you know, accommodation and travel and everything for those places. Whereas a lot of people presume that you live in London and therefore you don't get any accommodation. But mm. it depends on the project, for sure. Like, there are some projects where, you know, we put up people that don't live in London as a local for certain jobs and um if they want them some people are willing to pay for the pay for it and some people aren't you know and then it's up to the client yeah i was gonna say they'll... some of my lighting crew sometimes if if the commercial is by the studio they would actually tie like a holiday in just because it's better yeah. for them just to sleep and then drive back home if they live slightly out of london for example i've, I've known that happen people sort of ready to invest a little bit of money in whatever exactly. it is holiday in like 39 quid just to sleep um and if it's I do feel choice. strongly that people shouldn't be travelling back. Exactly. Like I do feel mm -hmm. like if, if a producer hires someone who doesn't live there, they should really pay for it and pay for that travel mm -hmm. or pay for that overnight, so that it's not dangerous for someone to drive, rather than the person pay for it for themselves. But then, you know, what it comes down to the overall deal. If someone's getting a really good rate, or if they're going to hire someone else anyway and they really want the job, then you know that's the balance. That's the fine line that we're, we're treading all the time. Helly. I think that's it in terms of questions. There are some, but they've sort of been answered already, so I'm not basically showing them. But okay. um, this has been great. Thank you so much for answering. Nice to see you. <laughs> and, and so nice to see you in this day and age of um, social distancing. Great. Thank you so, 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 so much. Thanks, Edgar. <laughs> see you later. Awesome, Ellie. All right. Bye, 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 bye.